Good morning, everyone. So we've been hearing for the last day about all of the grand challenges that we hope to be able to use biology to solve. You know, there's been applications in medicine. You know, as an example, this is Layla Richards, one of the first people to have successfully received gene therapy over at Great Ormond Street Hospital over in London. Yet the problem is biology of humans is incredibly complex, context sensitive, and we lack the tools that allow us to rapidly understand safety and efficacy of personalized therapeutics such as gene therapies. And we lack regulatory infrastructure that allows us to think about things not just in black and whites, but as continuous refinements of our beliefs about how do these complex systems work. In essence, in biology of human biology, our reach does not yet, well, exceeds our grasp. And of course, you know, in agriculture, we face grand challenges like how do we feed a growing population? And yet, today, crop science takes over a decade to bring a crop trait to market, $350 million of investment. And we're dealing with the complexities of engineering organisms where a single chromosome exceeds the size of the human genome. Not to mention the ploidities that come into play with many of the crop strains that we deal with today. And of course, we have to take the problems of how do we manufacture all the different products that we need, potentially with biology rather than process chemistry, fuels, paints, fibers. Well, today, the cost of the organism that actually makes one of these processes is well less than 5% of the cost it takes to actually scale and understand the context dependencies that come into play as an organism goes into a large-scale fermenter. So if we truly want to see all of these various consumer products coming to market, we need a much more effective way of dealing with the complexity that comes into play from the context of how biology works, not just a question of how do we generate more DNA. And that's why today, biotechnology is highly complex. It's error prone. It takes too long. It costs too much. It fails too often. And most importantly, most of the work that we do today cannot be composed atop. It cannot be built atop. Now, we've been in industry very good at understanding how to work with complicated processes. The way we manufacture today sits atop 160 years of process chemistry. You have major manufacturing sites like BASF's uh, Verbund facility in Germany where with that understanding of how to do unit operations, how to break down the complicated process of manufacturing a product into these individually understood actions, we can scale these things. And it, in this case, it means it employs 32,000 people in the process of bringing these products to market. But the industrial revolution that we're navigating now, what the World Economic Forum calls the fourth industrial revolution, is about how do we come to grips with complexity it's been about innovations in automation, innovations in AI, the tools that allow us to manipulate the physical world and interpret the complex outputs that come from it to augment our ability to reason beyond just the limitations of a pen and paper or an Excel spreadsheet. And biology is, of course, the ultimate complex system with behavior that emerges rather than just as something we engineer. And of course, the strategy we take with a complex system is profoundly different from the one we take for a complicated system. We can't just be reductionist, look at a single factor within the system at once. One of our major collaborations is with Merck, known as MSD over in Europe, where I'm from. And we've been helping them with the optimization of their biotherapeutic production platform. Now, quite commonly, you'll encounter situations like this, where if I look at just a single factor of the complex problem of engineering a manufacturing process, so part of the genetic space, I won't see that it has any apparent effect on yield in my process. And no matter how carefully I've measured that, I'm not differentiating that that factor has an impact. That's reductionism failing. On the other hand, if you start to look at things multifactorially, you can appropriately build models that give you the complex understanding of what's really going on in these systems, which means that all of a sudden you can discover there is an opportunity for a tenfold yield improvement in this process. And not just that, because we have an understanding of what's happening in this complex system, instead of making the mistake of going for the highest yielding process that I would have gotten from screening and missing the fact it won't work in the environmental context it will have to be scaled within, I'm instead able to, with genetics, lock in a cell line that's going to produce reliably in a large-scale manufacturing environment. That's actually engineering with biology, but the heart of it is model making. What happens if you don't make models effectively, if you don't treat biology with the respect it deserves? Well, you end up like the pharma industry, where for the last 65 years, every 18 months, it's doubled in cost to bring a product to market. 
That's what exponential complex explosions of design spaces not being handled looks like. And to be clear, we face similar challenges in the cost structure for industrial biotechnology, for ag science, and for, of course, all the novel applications we want to achieve with biology. So how do we turn that around? Well, the semiconductor industry has been a great exemplar to learn from. The heart of that transformation, though, was the early 1980s and the introduction of high-level languages to enable us to now separate what it is you are trying to accomplish in these spaces from how we did it. And, of course, it's the heart of productivity in computer science as well. You don't want to be the guy thinking about all the details of assembler, of how do I move bits around in the registers of a processor. You want to be able to state what your intent is. And that's how we've accomplished this exponential increase in the productivity per person in semiconductor designs, going from designs of four processors or transistors to designs of billions. And this is just the stair step compared to the complexity we have to tackle with biology. A single mammalian cell has 2.6 billion expressed proteins in them, which make a transistor look like a bicycle compared to a 787. So at Synthase, we have built with Antha that foundation for a biodesign automation. It's a high-level language that enables us to say what it is we're trying to accomplish in a wet lab. Combined with an operating system, which talks directly to all the various pieces of laboratory equipment, making it the executable representation of your process, meaning it bundles all the tacit knowledge it takes for someone else to reproduce your work directly into that representation and augments your ability to actually do the reasoning around these complex processes in the first place. What does that actually look like? It means that you can completely visually define an experiment, in this case by taking these reusable elements, translatable working practices, wiring up the flow of information and physical objects between them, and in the case here of about 45 seconds, having built your standard synthetic biology pipeline, including prepping your, your media, doing construct assembly, and transforming a cell line. And of course, this is then a representation that you can reason around. You can simulate your entire experiment and understand what is all the costs that come into play with it. What are every physical sample that comes out of it? What is every data point? What is the provenance that produced it? What are all the consumable requirements for this work? All the low-level detail that is not serving your science, that is, however, absolutely mandatory and necessary to enable it to actually execute in the physical world. And as I mentioned, this is the executable representation of your experiment. So you can now understand what are all the low-level details. How do your plates get laid out? How does the robot actually make this work? in a format that means it can be translated from running on a low-end liquid handler like a Gilson Pipette Max, or scaled in a centralized foundry powered by high-end technologies like a LabSide Echo. And of course, if you hit run at this point, your experiment's now off to the races. You're able to focus on the science, not just the how points, which today we're swamped in the details of in anything we do in a lab. And because it contains all the tacit knowledge it takes to talk about a working practice in a transferable way, you can also apply the same sorts of optimization and model making and machine learning that enables you to reason around the entire problems of bioengineering to the questions around how do you improve the base working practices. Taking things like construct assembly from producing a colony half the time and half of them being correct to producing colonies 100% of the time and 99% of them being the correct construct suddenly completely de-bottlenecking your ability to make the genetic interventions into the cell lines you need to do the complex experimental campaigns to unpick all of the moving pieces of a biological system. And that representation translates to the same outputs on different hardware from different manufacturers. The same benefits we take for granted from things like desktop publishing, that your PDF document will print on something from Epson or HP or anyone else. We see that this transition in how we work is mandatory to our ability to build a solid foundation where our work is by default reproducible and translatable, where we can share the respective innovations that we work with and enables us to begin to actually do the experiments that it takes to solve the complexity of biology, not just the ones that we're limited to by our current working practices. Thank you very much and hope that you uh, can join us on the journey of this technology. Any questions? Can you give us some idea of um, like 
is this open source? Is this a closed system? Uh, what are the cost structures like? Um, yes, so the core of Antha is open source up on GitHub. That's for the language. Uh, many of the drivers are unfortunately closed source because of the relationships I've been developing with hardware manufacturers, similar to how you have, say, a binary driver for a GPU on Linux, right? Uh, the visual IDE that I just showed you is the closed source licensed product, but it's licensed as a function of the hardware that you own and how much you're controlling through the system. So it's scaling as a function of what you're actually driving this with. And it's already in use in industry today. It powers, for instance, Dow Agro in their ag science pipeline, Merck in much of their discovery work, and now bioprocess development. It's just gone into GlaxoSmithKline, powering their own pharma development processes. So you'd be joining into what is a growing community, building off-the-shelf working practice libraries covering areas like mammalian engineering, E. coli work, uh, industrial microbes, et cetera. Right, so I know this is a hard question to answer, and it's, the answer is probably it depends, but what kind of cost structure are we talking about? I mean, pharmaceutical industry yeah. is kind of, those kind of prices are often out of sight of a lot of the people in this room. Essentially, it's proportionate to the CapEx cost of the hardware, roughly on par with what you're talking about for a service contract. Thank you very much.